Hello, welcome to Numeristical, continuing our series on baseball prediction. We are now in the 10th video of this series. So in the last video, we showed how to scrape all the individual batter data so that we could then come up with aggregated statistics for each batter. And then we were able to connect those to each game by seeing which nine batters were in the starting lineup. We could get their aggregated stats and then average across the lineup in different ways to create features about the quality of the, the starting lineup hitting team, as opposed to previously where we just used the average of the team, which didn't reflect which actual players were starting. So in this video now, we're gonna add those features into our model and see what kind of bump we get. Um, so before we go to the notebook again, I'd like to ask you to please, if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel, it really helps me out a lot, it helps me to keep making these videos and, 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 and keep going along this project. So thank you very much for doing that. And with that said, let's go on to the notebook. Okay, so once again, to reiterate, last time we scraped the individual batter data for 6,400 some odd players who have appeared in a starting lineup between 1980 and 2022. We processed this data to get statistics about the trailing performance of each player's right before the game in which they started. And doing this, we got features related to each player, and then we average across the lineup to get some lineup related statistics. So now let's add these in, see what happens. So we're gonna read our data frame that we created with these augmented statistics. And then as always, we're gonna build our training, validation, and test sets. Okay, so again, we're gonna build a function to try out a feature set to sort of simplify, simplify this process of trying different features. So we build the same, same try features function we had before. And first let's revisit the best model from our last section before we added any lineup features. So last time we had in the bull, bullpen features we got a bump, so let's, so we, we tried a few different models, and this was the best one. And if we let it run, you'll see that we got to 38 and a half basis points uh, distance from the Las Vegas probabilities. So that was pretty good. Before that, we'd been 70. We went down from 70 to just under 40. Now let's add up these, add in these lineup features. So let's start simple. Let's just say we're going to do, again, the on-base and the slugging, since those were the two that we have for, at the team level that seem to work the best. Let's take exactly those two for the whole lineup, average across all nine slots of the lineup, and let's add them in and see what happens. So we're now down to 29 basis points. We dropped another 10 basis points. So it's some progress, maybe not as much as we might have hoped. But, um, but again, remember that th this is only capturing, our team statistics are generally going to capture the quality of the team hitting, right? And this is only going to affect the relatively small percent of the games where there's an unusual lineup. So it'll impact many games that will really have no impact at all because the team statistics are pretty darn close to what the, what the typical lineup is but it's only for those games where a team had sort of an unusual lineup or a player was traded or something like that where we would expect this to have an impact. And if we look at the chat values, you'll see again, we've got these starter statistics on top. These are sort of old team statistics. Our old team hitting statistics are still valuable. They don't drop off the way sometimes, sometimes when you add in a redundant feature, it likes the new one so much better that it doesn't use the old one at all. Um, but that's not happening here. It's using both the team level ones and the lineup level ones. But you see all four of the lineup level statistics are, uh, are pretty high up on the list. So, so that's it. So now as a, as a comparison, I want to just show um, what happens if I didn't average across the lineup. What if I just tried to use the individual one through nine, so it had 18 variables, one for each player in the, in the team's lineups, 
and tried to do it that way rather than aggregating across the lineup. Let's just see what would have happened. So if we do that, you see overall it's it's still an improvement from our previous model, so it still helps. Um, but it's not as much, only drops us about six or seven basis points. It's it's a little bit worse than than just using the the two simple uh, aggregated statistics. So we have a lot more variables and slightly worse performance. Um, and if you see you have to scroll down, you see here's all these all these hitter hitting statistics and they're kind of low down and um, you know the, the issue is that you have to remember that that trees are do these very greedy uh, choices as to what to split on. And so it's it's strange to say, oh, because your sixth place hitter has this slugging percentage, now I think you know, you're more or less likely to win. It'd be weird for it to find a, a valuable judgment just based on these little individual things. It's much more, if you aggregate across the lineup, it's a much stronger indication of the quality of the team, whereas any one player might not be that useful to judge the team's performance. And I'm actually surprised it does as well as it does um, with these, with these uh, sort of 18 separate variables. Uh, one for each batter. Um, but I just wanted to put that in there to show like that it, it, you do get value sometimes out of simplifying your feature set. Now let's try if I add back in, what if I do both? I do both the individual ones and the lineup average ones. Let's see what happens. And you see we, we get about the same. It doesn't really improve. Uh, you know, improve our model uh, when we add those back in, 33.55 basis points, 33.77 basis points. So it's really about this, it, it really doesn't help. And in fact, so when we went from features one, which just had features zero and the lineup variables, it actually got worse than when we added in all of these individual things. It actually kind of distracted things. And again, these are very small changes, so you probably shouldn't read too much into that. But it's notable that it, it doesn't help. It doesn't help anymore. Um, so now let's just play around a little bit. So I'd come up with uh, different variants and we had different statistics. Let, let's see if we can improve by putting in a few more lineup related variables. So first let's try putting in uh, a few more. So let's put in the OBS, let's put in this modified slugging, let's put in the strikeout percentage of the batters in the lineup. And uh, let's add that in addition to the, 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 the two we already had, the on-base percentage of the slugging. And we see, again, it's a little bit worse. So, so that, that first features one gave us, brought us down to 29.2 basis points away from Las Vegas. And uh, everything else we're doing is putting us at about 33. Um, let's try this one. So this is the weighted. So if you remember, I, I came up with another variation that said, well, since the batters at the top of the order are going to bat more, maybe their batting averages are a little bit more important or their, their statistics in general are more important. So let, let's see if that weighting them helps give more of an effect. And we see again, 33, it still doesn't do as well as um, what we had before. And this is replacing, this is trying to do the weighted ones instead of the other ones, because they're gonna be probably very highly correlated. Um, let's see if we just use the eight, first eight people in the lineup, so didn't include the ninth slot, since I had an idea, maybe since the ninth slot has the picture, maybe that gets kind of uh, wacky. So maybe let's just focus on the, the eight. And again, 33. So all these things are doing about the same. Um, now let's try, we could try a couple. Oh, another thing I want to point out. Um, 
So for all of these, I've just been doing max depth too. And um, you can see though that even if I change the max depth, so let's go back up to the one where we had all of the individual columns. And you might say, well, I've got so many more columns, maybe I need deeper trees to, to fit these complicated interactions. And that's something that in general, when you change your feature sets, you probably want to try a few different max depth values because um, what worked the, the best max depth for one feature value for one set of features might not be the best, best max depth for another set of features, particularly if you're growing the set of features a lot. What I found is, I don't show this in all the videos because I'm doing this at home first before I show you, but I have been trying higher max depth values and I mean consistently, consistently, consistently max depth 2 has been the best. Every time I've tried max step three, it does, you know, slightly worse. So let's just show that here. So you see it went to 36, we had 33, and then we went to 36. So just to show it is something you should do. You should be trying out different max steps as you change, especially you increase the size of your feature set. Um, but, you know, I've been finding very consistently it's, it's not helping. Um, so let's just go down here. What if I add in, okay, we've got the on base and the slugging. Those seem, that, that pair seems to be the most valuable. What if we add in a few different time ranges? So let's add in the 350 game look back and also the 75 game look back. Um, in addition to, uh, in addition to the extra one. So I'm kind of throwing a lot at it now, seeing if it helps. Thirty-four. You know, I could I could try to try a higher max depth. Thirty-five. See, it's almost every time. Um, let's let's take out lineup B just for kicks and see what happens there. So you see, almost everything I'm trying is ending up around 33 basis points. It's, it's sort of, you know, you play around a bit and you see that it's not helping very much. Um, as a final thing that I'm going to use in the next section, I want to look at, go back to our very simple model, the one that we had in like the second video, where we just had team on base percentage, team slugging. And I just want to have that model because I'm going to use this in my analysis a little bit later. Um, so you see this one, this was like our first model, and we're 150 basis points away from Las Vegas. Um, so. so the upshot here seems to be, okay, we could get we got down from about 40 to about 30. We played around with different combinations, nothing really seemed to help that much. Um, so that's an improvement, but we are we seem to be kind of running out of steam, right, in terms of our Every time we add in a new set of stuff, it's having a smaller and smaller impact on the model. So that might cause us to rethink some of our strategy for how we're going to try to do better on this. Um, but uh, before I talk about what we're going to do next, I want to do a little bit of analysis of this model to try to get a sense of a couple questions. One is, how much evidence do we have that adding this lineup really improved the model? So we got 10 basis points. So we try different combinations, we get about like a seven basis point improvement, you know, is there any other way we could try to more objectively say that this last enhancement improved the model? So that's one question I want to address. And then another question I want to address is, the Las Vegas model is clearly still better overall, but is there any way in which we, at this model, is sort of adding value to that? In other words, are, are there things, ways in which our model is better? Is our model catching anything that they're not? So maybe they're doing better overall, but maybe we're seeing a few things that they're not. And I'm going to try to address both of, both of these questions. So to try to get at these, first, I'm going to look at the discrepancies. So um, here's the discrepancies. So the distance between our model probability and the Vegas probability for the model our previous best model without the lineup features and our current best model that has the lineup features. So this top one is the one that had like a 40 basis point difference from Vegas. And this is the one that has like a 30 basis point difference from Vegas. 
So, and now I'm going to plot histograms over each other. And one's going to be blue, one's going to be yellow, and the overlap is going to be green. So we can see how these histograms overlap. And so you can see the blue means that the, the new model is kind of sticking out behind the old model. And the yellow means that the old model is kind of sticking out. So what this shows is that in the old model, we had sort of the yellow plus the green. And in the new model, we, had the, we have the blue plus the green. So we see that our discrepancies compare to the Vegas model. So we're kind of assuming that getting, better to the, getting closer to the Vegas model predictions is better. Um, but you can see that we are getting closer to the Vegas model. Um, so that's some evidence that, that this did help. It did push our probabilities on average closer. And if you just want a sort of a numerical look at this, let's just take the absolute value on average, on average, how far are we from the Las Vegas model with the new model and with the old model. And you see that now we're about 3.99, it's almost exactly on average 4% away from the Las Vegas probability before we were on average 4.3%. So small difference, but something. And then also keep in mind, we're not totally, you know, the Las Vegas probabilities are not necessarily perfectly right. So something else to keep in mind when we do this analysis. But th this shows that I think, you know, this is a real improvement, this 10 basis point improvement. This, this gives some more evidence to suggest that this is not just sort of random noise or something like that. We do seem to be getting better. Next, I want to address this question of are, are we seeing, is there any value to our model? Are we seeing anything that Las Vegas is not? So what I'm going to do is this is where I'm going to use our weak models. This was our very first naive model that just had the two very simple team hitting statistics. I'm going to call those, those predictions the weak model predictions. And then I'm going to look at our, our current best model and call that the strong model predictions. And now I'm going to do this thing where I say, what if we averaged, we did a weighted average of the two models. So I've got the Las Vegas probabilities. I could use the Las Vegas probabilities by themselves. I could use the, our models probabilities by themselves, or I could use an average. I could take, what if we split the difference, took half of one and half the other and averaged them together. What kind of prediction would that give us? And it doesn't have to be half, half. It could be a weighted average. I could say, let's factor in, you know, the Las Vegas model, give it 75% weight or 80% weight and our model 25 or 20% weight and see how that looks. So first let's show what that looks like for the very simple model when we, as we average in. So this is the log loss. The far left of this is what we get when we have just the Las Vegas model. The far right is what we get when we have just our simple model. And you can see it just generally gets worse as we average in our model with the Las Vegas model. Now, if you look very closely, actually, this is going to tell us, let's subtract the value at this very first point. Um, take that value minus the absolute lowest value in this curve. So it turns out that if you look at this, this curve actually goes down by a, you know, a tenth of a basis point across the first three, three points here. So it's, it's so small that you don't even see it. But there is a slight improvement, but that's uh, you know too small to even be significant. I would say it's probably just noise. It's really not. It's really not any evidence that this very simple model is catching anything that the Vegas model is. But now let's make the same plot for our latest model, the strong model. And so here you see something different, right? The we actually do better. We get a better log loss when we average in our model with the Las Vegas model. Now we want to only average in, we're going to average our model about 20% and the Las Vegas model 80%. And with that, we get an improvement of, you know, two and a half basis points. So it's not a huge improvement, but this gives some evidence to say, hey, Vegas, the Vegas probabilities are not perfect. 
because actually here's another model averaging in Vegas plus a little bit of our model gives us better predictions and again you could quibble about whether you know could this happen with noise but it didn't happen with this weak model right it didn't happen with this weak model but it did happen with the strong model so again this is not super sound completely convincing evidence but I would say it gives us it gives us some some level of evidence some level of justification that we are catching some things that the Las Vegas model isn't. Um, so if, if you've done some machine learning, you know, the, the, this whole concept of ensembling where you do different modeling techniques <clears throat> and average them, and often you see that the average of the models is better than any individual ones. This is one of the sort of early observations in, in the machine learning age. Um, so what that means is that different models are seeing things that other models aren't seeing. So if you average them together, it tends to be better. So, so what we're seeing is our model is catching some things. Okay, so that, that's interesting to me that, that our model is sort of has some signal that the Vegas probabilities are not catching. Next, I want to try to get a sense. So if you remember in a previous video, we tried to assess how much we should expect the log loss to vary just by sort of the nature of the test set, how big the test set was, and, and the sort of uh, natural variation we would expect that we're, we're observing just one kind of set of coin flips on this test set. Now I'm going to do something similar here, but now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say you've got a single test set, and I'm going to, I'm going to, simulate different models that are all about the same quality and I'm going to see how much variation there is in that. So let's try to make this a little more clear. We're going to start with what we think is sort of the true probability and I'm going to start with the Las Vegas probabilities here. Again, they're not really the true probabilities um, but but let's let's assume that they are. Let's assume that the Las Vegas probabilities are really spot on and so our discrepancies couldn't possibly improve the predictions in the long run, right? We might get lucky that, you know, our model estimates the true probability gets some error. And uh, maybe occasionally we get lucky in that we make the errors that happen to coincide with what actually happened. Like, like the, the teams that won, we happen to make more errors adding probabilities to the teams that won than adding probability to the teams that lost. And so uh, we do a little better uh, once in a while, but we wouldn't expect that to happen a lot of the time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at our discrepancies and shuffle them. So, so for example, let's say Las Vegas predicted 0 0.6, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 and I predicted 0 0.7, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So the discrepancies are uh, plus 0.1, minus 0.1, minus 0.2. Now I'm gonna randomly shuffle. I'm gonna create a new distribution where I start with those true Las Vegas probabilities again and shuffle that vector of discrepancies and come up with a new thing. So if the Las Vegas probabilities were really you know, the, the, the perfect probabilities, you couldn't get any better than this. Every time we shuffle these discrepancies, it shouldn't, it shouldn't on average be any better or worse. It'll get better or worse by luck, but there's no reason offhand to think that any one of these models will be better than any other. Because in any case, we're taking the true probabilities, we're taking some set of discrepancies and we're randomly attaching that same set of discrepancies to each of those probabilities. So I'm going to define this function which is going to simulate this for however many trials I want. I'm going to run it for 10,000 trials and then we're going to plot the answer. When I plot it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot what log losses we get on these different models with these different shuffle discrepancies. And then I'm going to put in um, what the actual log loss of our model was. So 
So you see on average, here's the range of outcomes we get over 10,000 trials. When, uh, when we simulate this idea of take the Las Vegas probabilities, shuffle up these discrepancies and throw them on there. And so it should be that if the Las Vegas probabilities are perfect and our discrepancies are just noise, we wouldn't expect any set of any particular rotation of these discrepancies to be better than any other, um, you know, on average, meaningfully. So if that were the case, we would be likely, we'd be kind of, our particular model would be a, a random distribute, a random choice from this bell curve over here. But if you see where we end up, we ended up with a pretty good one. So I could, I didn't go through the trouble of calculating the percentile, but the fact that we ended up on the sort of good side of the curve, the, lo the low log loss side of the curve, gives us some, gives some evidence to say, okay, maybe we just got lucky and we happened to draw the discrepancies that were good, but it also might mean, hey, we actually have some, we actually have some signal here. So these are very, very subtle analyses. Um, and, you know, if you're having trouble sort of grasping this or following along, you shouldn't, you shouldn't feel bad at all because I'm still sort of wrapping my head around some of these things. I haven't totally processed this yet at all. But these sorts of analyses, I think, are really good when you're trying to get at, you know, am I making progress or am I just, just getting different samples of noise in my improvements? So here we have a couple, couple ways to sort of convince ourselves or give ourselves evidence that like, okay, we, we actually are improving the model, that, that we're not just randomly getting noise. Okay. So what conclusions can we draw? Well, we went from about, again, we we're about 40 basis points off the Vegas model before, to about 30 basis points now, um, just by adding, you know, two, two variables, the on base and the slugging and the two variants for the home and away. So it's four total variables, but really, you know, two different things. Uh, when we changed these variants, added more variables, didn't really seem to have much of an effect. And the Vegas model is still better overall, but there is some evidence that our model is capturing some things they don't, um, you know, by those last two plots, the fact that we, uh, that we, when you average in our model, it actually improves it a little bit, and that um, if you if you if you took the null hypothesis that the Vegas model was perfect, it would we got a pretty unlikely lucky set of discrepancies from our model. Okay, so what are the next steps? Uh, Next, I really want to get into modeling run scored. So I talked about this a little bit last time. Um, we have all these hitting and pitching statistics, and we're trying to predict this outcome of win or loss. But there's this very important middle step that we know about, which is how many runs did you score? We know that, that the way better hitting improves your likelihood of winning the game is through scoring more runs. And the way better pitching improves your likelihood of winning the game is by giving up fewer runs. And we have that, that observation of the number of runs scored for each game. So it seems like we could reduce some noise by saying, hey, instead of trying to predict this outcome over here, let's predict this nearby outcome over here and then build some model for when we know what the distribution is over here on the run scored, let's then predict the winner of the game. So modeling run score will be helpful in two ways. It will help us for predicting the winner of the game, as I just described, but it's also going to be really useful for, for predicting the over-under, right? If, if we have the distribution of runs for one team, uh, the home, let's say the home hitting versus the visiting pitching, I have some distribution of how many runs I think you're going to score with what probabilities. And then we have another distribution for the opposite with the opposite team sitting and pitching. Then we can look at those two distributions and assess what's the probability it'll be over or under a particular value. So to do this, we're going to use something called probabilistic regression. 
So probabilistic regression is a method where you say, I've got a numerical target, but I'm not just going to try to predict a point estimate. I'm not just going to say, oh, on average, I expect 3.3 runs to be scored by this team. They're going to actually say, there's a 10% chance they'll get zero. There's a 15% chance they'll get one. There's a 20% chance they'll get two and so on, all the way out to like 15 or something. And this will be really useful um, and we're, and we're going to see we're going to see how powerful that is, and we'll also use some some new techniques so that we're going to use some code in the structure abuse package that I developed. It's still pretty preliminary, and it's a little bit slow, but it will do will do exactly what we want. It will do probabilistic regression and give us these nice distributions and, and be fairly easy to work with. So that's what we're going to do next time. So thanks, thanks for joining me on this. Um, again, if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel, it would really help me out a lot. Uh, the next video, we're going to show how to, how to, we're going to have to rearrange, wrangle our data again a little more to get it into a form where we now have, here's a certain team's hitting statistics, here's the opposing team's pitching statistics, here's how many runs the hitting team scored. And from that, we'll have a model then that says, given this, this set of hitters, this set of pitchers, how many runs do we expect to be scored? And then for a particular game, we could say, okay, well, we have this hitting versus this pitching. We expect this distribution of runs scored. We've got the opposite teams hitting and pitching. We expect this number of runs to be scored with these probabilities. Let's use those two probability distributions now to compute how many runs total we think are going to be in the game. So we're going to do that next, work on the over-under, and then later, we might even be able to go back and use those distributions as features in the model to predict the winner for the game. So that's where we're headed next, and I hope you'll continue to join me for that. Um, again, thank you very much, and I, I hope you have a great day.